Well, hello, this is a uh, lecture 11 for microbiology. This will cover the infections of the skin and the respiratory system. This will be in the chapters 21, 22. We're gonna start with the skin first, of course. But what I do wanna do is bring your attention a couple of things right off the bat, and that is the primer for microbiology diseases, that handout that I provided before. The concepts for consideration in this area, of course, we're gonna be dealing with in, in sort of an approach of uh, what are the basically uh, the symptoms, causative agent, pathogenesis, epidemiology, prevention and treatment. But to get you thinking about it, you have to start asking yourself the question, what is the organ or system infected by the pathogen? Is the infection localized or can it or has it become systemic? What is the pathogen, the type and species as well as the presence of virulence factors? What is the state of the immune system function of the patient? Is a vector or carrier required for the disease, or can this occur from local flora? What is the treatment for this disease, including the drug and the time course of therapy? And is a vaccine available? Also, I want to bring to your attention that there is some very good information here in the uh, chapter key terms, as well as the glimpse of history. Very interesting work done by Ricketts in uh, chapter 22, so I encourage you to take some time to review. Now, what we're going to be doing is covering uh, the skin system first, so we need to discuss a couple of things. Of course, this is the largest organ of the entire body. The functions for skin include controlling body temperature, control and prevention, prevention of loss of fluid, the synthesis of vitamin D, as well as providing a sensory information of the environment, hot, cold, uh, painful stimuli, that type of thing. We also have immune functions in the skin, and these are both cell-mediated and cytokine production. When you look at the layers of the skin, we have the epidermis, which is the outermost layer, flattened cells that are rich in keratin. The cells are constantly being shed off. The lowest part of the layers of the epidermis are involved with the mitosis, the replacement of those cells. And as they move upward through the layers, they eventually die out, but provide a very solid um, insulation layer against certain materials and environmental assaults, etc. In the dermis, this is laden with blood vessels, nerves, lymphatic vessels. The subcutaneous level, which is also referred to as the hypodermis, is laden with fat cells. Now, sebum is an oily secretion made by the sebaceous glands. Some bacteria break down the oil for fatty acids. We also have sweat glands, which provide a salty liquid, which helps with temperature regulation. The normal pH range for skin is 4.0 to 6.8. Now, what I could do is turn your attention to table 21.1, and there you see some of the normal microbiota of the skin. Now, abundance differs depending on where moisture exists. Also, moisture is important not just for bacteria, but also for the fungal organisms. Uh, diterotoids, di Diphthoid, diphtheroids, excuse me, is a group resembling uh, diphtheria bacteria. Cornibacterium diphtheriae is present, but it doesn't produce the exotoxins. It does contribute to the uh, formation of body order. Proprinium bacteria acines is an anaerobic or an aerotolerant, um, and this resides mostly in the oily hair follicles. It can cause acne. Staphylococcus. The particular species we're talking about here is Staphylococcus epidermis. And this, and due to the dry, salty environment of the skin, very few organisms can survive. Uh, this one seems to be able to. Most of the species have little virulence. Some can cause disease if the host defenses are impaired. Most of these organisms compete for nutrients to prevent pathogens from colonizing on the skin. Also, they produce antimicrobial substances that keep uh, P. acnes and other organisms in check. Before I go, I wanted to bring up a couple of images so that you see this. Here, of course, is up close. You see the hair follicle and diterotoids, such as proprionum bacteria, present in the hair follicle shaft, as well as some of the oil glands. You will see also staphylococci present on some of the sheets of the skin, as well as malacia, which is a yeast. And you can see the normal anatomy of the skin. 
Here is another image of some of the streptococci. And aside of uh, the staphylococci and the diteratoids, we also have some of the other organisms, uh, fungi. These are lipophilic, in other words, fat loving organisms. They're tiny, most of them are harmless. Malacia is one. Malacia for fur can cause an unusual phenomenon called tinea versicolor. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move over here. I want you to be aware that some of the diseases caused by Staphylococcus aureus, they will exist on the skin. Some of them are going to be covered in this particular section. Some of them will be covered in other chapters. And these include, of course, things, carbuncles, endocarditis, folliculitis, food poisoning, furuncles, impetigo, scalded skin syndrome, toxic shock syndrome, and wound infections. And there is an entire section on wound infections we will be going through. Okay. Now, by the way, uh, tinea versicolor which causes skin discolorations and forms a yeast-like and pseudohyphase, a very serious problem for AIDS patients. We'll get into that a little bit later on in this chapter. For bacterial skin diseases, few organisms will invade the skin directly. Some can invade via the hair shaft, as we showed you a minute ago. Many can invade via skin wounds. And again, this is where we're going to get into um, diseases and infections of the wounds. I believe it's chapter, uh, the 13th lecture, and it will provide itself very interesting. When we talk about acne vulgaris, this is caused by Proprium bacteria acnes, which is an anaerobic or aerotolerant, and again, they reside mostly in the oily hair follicles. They can cause acne. And you can see this here on the diagram. Uh, what happens, interestingly enough, is acne is the overproduction of sebum and clumps of hair follicle epithelium, leading to a plugging up of a sebum gland duct. Now, you got to understand that P. Uh, acnes have lipases. They break down the sebum, resulting in fatty acids and glycerol, which the bacteria use for cell food. Um, the metabolic products of the bacteria initiate an inflammatory response, and they can cause the rupture of the gland, formation of an abscess, and subsequent healing and scarring. As you can see here, you have the accumulation of the bacteria, which is followed up by accumulation of white blood cells, and you can have this formation, this plug of pus that will eventually form uh, an abscess. Okay, and. An abscess is a localized collection of pus which consists of white blood cells, bacteria cells, cell debris within a tissue. Now, with hair follicle infections, uh, this can take on several different approaches. Uh, if you notice on figure 22.2, the symptoms can appear as folliculitis, a red bump or pimple. You have an infected hair follicle. You can have a boil which is also known as a furuncle. This is localized infection that is spread to neighboring tissue. Okay, A carbuncle is a large area of redness and swelling and pain with several sites of pus drainage. Fever may be present, usually occurring in areas of thicker skin, such as the neck. Okay, And this is usually caused by Staphylococcus aureus, Staph A. The difference is that it has a coagulase uh, enzyme present, so it's coagulase positive. Now, this enzyme catalyzes the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin, and this is found in the plasma, and it results in a clot formation. And the process is pretty clear. You can see this in 22.2, okay? And what you see happening there, eventually, is that sometimes the S. aureus will have virulence factors to defense defend against the host immune system. The interesting thing is that S. aureus is commonly uh, flora in nostrils and it can be passed by infected food handlers. Now, I know this can be a little bit disturbing, but, you know, people will rub their nose, pick their nose, other things like that, sadly. 
and sometimes they were even wearing gloves. I've actually seen where they did, you know, the the videos of street food handlers in uh, New York City, and their hands are everywhere, and they have the gloves on, but whatever gets on their hands obviously may get into food, and that that you're going to have a problem with. For prevention and treatment with boils and carbuncles, it's surgical draining and antibiotics. Usually due to penicillin resistance, you end up needing to use uh, beta-lactamase resistant penicillins, cephalosporins, or vancomycin. And here are some of the uh, virulence factors that are involved with Staph A, Staphylococcus aureus. Notice that you have a variety of them that help prevent uh, the immune system from fighting against this. And this includes the capsule product. You also have a situation where you have the clumping factor. The clumping factor uh, attaches to the, ba uh, the bacteria fibrin, fibrinogen, and, and, and along with coagulase, which may slow the process of leukocytes into an infected area by basically producing clots, what you're going to have is a situation where you really have the bacteria being protected or isolated from full forward attacks by the immune system. Then you have a variety of other um, uh, enzymes, lipases, proteases. Uh, you also have the problem of toxic shock syndrome toxin, which causes rash, diarrhea, and shock. And alpha toxin, which makes holes in host cell membranes. Host cell membranes would include not merely endothelial cells, not merely just fibro, uh, fibroblasts, but it would also include, yep, white blood cells. Now, here is where the virulent molecule, molecules of Staphylococcus aureus in their cell envelope would be approached. Now, you notice that, again, Staphylococci had this clumping or bunching effect. So that's where they got into this grapes appearance. They tend to, as a result of their, uh, when they build up their colonies, form what's called the golden grapes. And that's where they get aureus. Aureus refers to gold, the color. And you can see there that basically between the peptidoglycan and the polysaccharide capsule, and then extending out, you have a variety of uh, virulence factors. And some of these can basically disarm even things like antibodies, as you see there with protein A. Now, the next disorder we're going to look into is scalded skin syndrome. Uh, the symptoms are a tender red rash, peeling of skin, fever, malaise, the vague feeling of discomfort or uneasiness, S. aureus exotoxin uh, exfolatin, is present, and usually that's breaking ester bonds that hold the skin layers together. So you get these sheets or peeling off that occurs. Uh, this is where you have Staphylococcus again, aureus, and it contains the gene for exfolatin, and usually that gene will be found either on the plasma or in the chromosome. The exotoxin carry is carried by the blood to the skin region. The skin forms blisters and then just basically peels away. It leads the patient open to secondary infections, you know, invasion of damaged tissues by new organisms. Epidemiologically, about 5% of S. aureus produces exfolatins. Sometimes it appears in nurseries, immunocompromised adults and elderly. Person-to-person -person contact transmission is possible. The prevention and treatment, you isolate the patient from the others. You treat with methicillin. You remove the dead skin. That's a debridement issue to prevent secondary infection. Now from there, and here's another example of scalded skin syndrome, this is an infant, and you can see how literally sheets of the skin have been peeling off, and underneath that redness is, of course, inflammation, and you're down to, in some cases, the dermis, not just the epidermis. Here is S. aureus in blood agar. You have the beta hemolysis occurring. So underneath where all that blood agar, where, where the blood cells are, they're being lysed by the presence of this. Staphylococcus scalded skin syndrome is uh, described in table 22.4. Okay. So let's now move to sta uh, streptococcal impetigo. Superficial skin infection involving 
patches of epidermis that develop thin-walled blisters that break and weep plasma and pus. They form golden crusts and some lymph node enlargement may occur. Pyroderma, or pyoderma, is a skin infection characterized by pus production. The causative agent is Streptococcus pyrogens, which can lead to glomerular nephritis, which is really not good, or it can be caused by S. aureus, and they cause huge blisters due to the exfoliatum. Now, to give you some background here, glomerular nephritis. Uh, basically, this is caused by S. pyogens, and it is the inflammation of the glomeruli and the subsequent shutdown of kidney function due to accumulation of immunocomplexes, that is antibodies plus the bacterial agent in the glomeruli. You have fluid retention, fever, blood and protein in the urine, and high blood pressure would be the symptoms. Okay. Um, there is also on table 22.5, a very nice table that differentiates between S. pyrogens and Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, and I would encourage you to review that. Epidemiologically, this is spread by insects, formites, carriers, or infected patients. Prevention and treatment, general cleanliness, avoiding infected patients, proper cleaning of skin wounds with an antiseptic. With S. pyogens, you have to treat with penicillin or erythromycin. Okay, so from there, and you can see this with, uh, this is the uh, glomerular nephritis situation. What happens is you have these antibody immune complexes and they will cluster up and block up the filtration that occurs in the glomeruli. And so what happens is you have a reduced amount of renal filtration occurring and you have a buildup of fluid. It's going to show up. You're going to get puffiness around the eyes. You're going to have higher blood pressure, you're going to have blood and protein in the urine, and it's just going to be a mess. Notice you'll also have swollen ankles. This is also due to fluid retention. Now let's move to the next one, and you see all the spots? This is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Um, it is described very nicely uh, on table 22.7. The symptoms are headache, pains in the joints and muscles, fever, Hemorrhagic rash that begins in the extremities. The causative agent is rickettsia rickettsii. Uh, it is transmitted by a tick bite, usually the wood tick. And there you see also more of these little hemorrhages, almost petechiae, basically small patches of it throughout the body. Here you see the rickettsia. Now, rickettsia are a little bit different than your common bacteria. Basically, they have to live inside the cells. They have uh, limited tools for manipulation and thriving. And so they have to be transmitted by an arthropod, in this case, ticks. Uh, it can be a wood tick, Dermacenter ansoni, west or dog ticks, Dermacenter variabilis, which you see mostly in the east. The wood tick is mostly seen in the western part of the United States. The bacteria will infect capillary epithelial cells. They'll multiply, rupture the cell to spread, and infect more epithelial cells. This leads to basically the capillary inflammation, clotting, death of the tissue. You have this rash of the small hemorrhages, as you see there. It looks like a speckling. Okay? Now, epidemiologically, you take a look at figure 22.8, and what you see is there are certain areas of the country uh, that there's a prevalence. A lot of places it's going to be in areas where ticks would be, woodlands, country land, uh, meadows, things like that. The disease exists primarily in animals other than humans. The transmission from ticks to mammals does occur. Humans are tending to be the accidental host. Uh, the prevention really is to avoid tick-infested areas, wick, wear tick repellents, remove ticks carefully, treat with tetracycline and chloramphenicol. There is your nasty little wood tick. And here is, of course, the table uh, 22.7 as for a review. 
keep in mind that here's something of interest. Um, basically, Ricketts, as mentioned in the glimpse in history, was quite remarkable as he was really one of the first to isolate and identify the Ricketsia. Howard Ricketts, and I was doing research because I did uh, for my doctorate part uh, coursework in uh, Ricketsia, this type of bacteria. It was very interesting because what he literally did, there was no animals and he suspected that ticks carried this uh, pathogen. And so he literally had one attached to him and he cultured it basically on his chest for some time to kind of prove that this actually did occur. He eventually died of uh, tick-borne diseases later on in his life. Now, we move from here to another tick-borne disease, Lyme disease. And you can see that the stage one is an enlarging red rash. Uh, this is at the tick uh, bite site. They also call it the bullseye. As you can see, you will have fever, malaise, headache, enlargement of lymph nodes near the bite site, joint pain. Stage two, though, is acute involvement of the heart and nervous system. That is where uh, the spirochetes of Borrelia burgdorferi, that's the bacteria, will begin to do damage to, for example, the pacemaker cells of the heart and some of the nervous system. Then stage three, chronic arthritis and impairments of nervous system. The incubation is about one week. Also, you need to be aware of this. Not all individuals who get Lyme disease have a rash that will appear. Only two out of three cases. Uh, as I mentioned to you, the causative agent is the spirochete Borrelia burgdorferi, and this is due to a bite from an infected black-legged uh, tick, Exoidius scapularis. Here's another of the bullseye marks. This is the spirochete. Notice that it's somewhat spiral-shaped. The prevalence of this is quite extreme, particularly in the Northeast and in the, the northern, uh, northwestern or middle America in the northern area. Uh, this is where there are tick-rich areas, or basically they were quite prominent, okay? Now, there's got to be another host in on this, so let me help you to understand this first. Here is the black-legged tick with a paperclip as a comparison, very small. But the life cycle goes like this. You have the ticks that lay their eggs, and these are infected eggs. So this is where you get what is referred to as horizontal transmission as well as vertical transmission. In other words, you can have individuals infected or individuals will pass what's called transovarially the uh, pathogens. Um, what happens in this case, as you can see in the diagram from spring to summer early, the first cycle, first year, is the uninfected larvae will hatch and you'll get anywhere from 250 to 300 larvae around an infected mouse. It's usually um, brown mice or wood mice that basically are the first carriers, and they will help carry uh, the larva through the first year. By that time, after they've been feeding off the mouse for a while, they will um, come out after winter, and they will develop into nymphs, and the infected nymphs will feed, and they will transmit Borrelia burgdorferi. Now, what happens is they will either attach to a mammal, whether it's human, mice again, or usually deer, okay? And what happens is it is the deer that transfer them all over the place. Usually when a deer lays down, they had said that about three meters around it, or there will be the pot potential that some of the dicks have fall, uh, ticks have fallen off. Also, when spring comes and fall comes for these ticks to attach uh, to mammals for the wintering season, they will usually climb up stalks of grass, etc., and they will have their front limbs out and just grab on anything that passes by it. Now, 
The infected larva will inquire infection uh, feeding on the infected animal, usually a white-footed mouse, and that's the host. Or they will get it during the adult stage uh, with an infected host such as a white-tailed deer. Now, as I said, humans are the accidental host here. Organisms migrate outward from the bite site in a radial fashion. That's where you get that bullseye looking uh, rash. Eventually they spread to the bloodstream. The immune reaction to the bacterial antigens causes tissue damage. Heart tissue, nervous tissue, and joint tissue. And usually what is the result is autoimmune in nature. In other words, it tricks the immune system to start attacking your own tissues. Prevention and treatment, basically prevention, avoid tick bites. Uh, have tick repellent material added onto your clothing, etc. Early treatment is with doxycycline. Later cases, you have to do intravenous amphicillin or ceftriaxone. Okay. And here is the basic rundown on the table for Lyme disease. Sadly, there are individuals that uh, basically developed arthritis and didn't know this. Now, where the Lyme comes in, is out, out in old Lyme, Connecticut. They had a massive, uh, what they would call um, outbreak or cluster from an epidemiological terminology of cases of arthritis. And they didn't know what it was causing it. And they eventually tracked it down to the ticks that were out there. And if you go to old Lyme, Connecticut now, you can still go to places and there will be signs you might want to walk in that meadow or something, and they'll have signs saying this is a tick, uh, a high tick area. So they discourage people from walking around there. Okay, from here, we're going to move to viral skin diseases. And eczematha is a skin rash. Many rashes occur as viruses uh, that infected the respiratory system traveled in the blood to the skin. So we're going to deal with a few of them right off the bat, and the first one is chickenpox, varicella. Symptoms, as you can see, itchy bumps and blisters, small red spots are macules, little bumps are papules, small blisters are vesicles, and that's how they develop in that pattern. Fever will start up and then later will manifest itself sometimes years later as shingles. Here's the deal with shingles and chickenpox. Chickenpox you've been exposed to. But what will happen is the virus, the herpes zoster, uh, basically hides in the trigeminal nerve. And you end up with a reactivation of the chicken pox later. Uh, in shingles, it basically will be a pain in the area served by a sensory nerve. Therefore, it's going to be limited to one side of the body. So if you have uh, not bilateral, but unilateral band of a rash, it's usually indicative of shingles. OK, the the area will be infected with the virus. The rash will develop afterwards at that site. The rash subsides, but pain may last for weeks or longer. Usually occurs during a breakdown of cell mediated immune memory uh, years later. So in other words, what we're talking about is the immune system, which has been keeping the virus as it might leak out of the trigeminal nerve area in check. If that immune system starts breaking down, then you're going to start having the proliferation of this uh, virus. Now, there is another disorder you need to be aware of related that's called Rye syndrome. It, it mostly occurs with children receiving aspirin for either influenza or chicken pox. It is often a fatal condition characterized by vomiting, coma, and brain or liver damage. Now, as I said, the causative agent for chickenpox is a varicella zoster virus. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. This is an enveloped, double-stranded DNA virus. It is a member of the herpes virus family. Uh, the pathogenesis, basically the portal of entry, is usually respiratory. It infects the lungs, replicates, travels into the blood system, uh, the bloodstream to the skin cells, and in skin cells will infect and spread to adjacent cells in living layers of the skin and spread to sensory nerves, where it travels to the sensory ganglia. Humans are basically the only reservoir. Incubation lasts about two weeks. Immunization reduces incidence. The prevention and treatment. There is a vaccine for chickenpox available. should be done before the 13th birthday. Zoster immune globulin, ZIG, exists to passively immunize the patient 
acyclovir and femcyclovir are helpful in preventing and treating varicella zoster infections. Okay, here's some more of the rash. Here is unfortunately the virus. And here is the table which would give you the review of the pathogenesis, the breakdown of how it occurs. From here, we're going to move into measles. And that little fellow there has a bad case of the measles. Not German measles, regular measles. Regular measles would be called rubiola. German measles is rubella. So let's get into the differences. If you want, take a look at 2210. Now, I'm going to get into this image first, and then we'll get to the table. Measles are also referred to as red measles or hard measles. The formal name is rubiola. The symptoms include rash, fever, weepy eyes, cough, nasal discharge, secondary uh, infections of uh, S. aureus or step, uh, streptococcus pneumoniae or streptococcus pyogens, or Haemophilus influenzae can occur due to measles damaging the normal body defenses. Usually this leads to pneumonia or earaches. Rubiola virus is a single-stranded, negative-sense RNA virus of the paramyxovirus family. The portal of entry is respiratory. The mucous membranes are involved and they are also an important diagnostic sign. This is called coplic spots. They are salt grain-like spots, and you can see them here. And they're right on, as you can see this, right on the, the side walls of the mouth and on the tongue, in some cases underneath the tongue. Now, basically, Measles virus temporary, temporarily suppresses cellular immunity and can lead to cold sores or latent tuberculosis to reactivate. That's why individuals have to be very clear about dealing with measles outbreaks because they can cause a cascade of other uh, latent disorders to start popping up in the patients. Now, a vaccine is available. Humans are the only natural host to the rubiola virus. Outbreaks have been contained except by infants and those that are not vaccinated. Uh, vaccine attenuated rubiola virus is basically what you're seeing. Um, and I may add this, you will hear from time to time, if you listen carefully in the news, that this particular city or this particular community or this particular group had an outbreak of measles. Reason usually is some individuals have uh, neither in, in, basically inoculated themselves or the uh, herd immunity of that particular group has been reduced because some individuals have not received a vaccination or followed up on follow-up vaccines for a period of time and now have become vulnerable to measles. Keep in mind that the vaccine is part of the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. It's given to children, college students, medical personnel, there is no present uh, antiviral treatment. Moving from here, we're going to go to rubella, German measles, okay? And you can see this, the symptoms are mild fever, cold symptoms, rash beginning on the forehead and face, and large lymph nodes behind the ears. The causative agent is the rubella virus, which is a small envelope, single-stranded RNA virus of the toga virus family. The portal of entry is respiratory. It multiplies in the nasopharynx, travels to the bloodstream, travels to the skin and joints, and starts forming antigen-antibody complexes, which can account for the rash and the joint symptoms. What you see there is, of course, a figure 22, 11, uh, 21, which is the reported cases of German measles and congenital uh, rubella syndrome. And you notice that basically as rubellas a uh, number of cases has dropped. The CRS has also dropped, okay? And what this is, when I say congenital rubella syndrome, is that rubella, German measles, was really nasty at one point in our history um, because the virus can cross the placenta. It leads to severe birth defects as the virus will infect all fetal cells, less in certain cases in the later fetal stages of development. 
And how serious? Well, it can cause abnormalities in the eye. It can lead to blindness. Uh, it can lead to brain damage, deafness, heart defects, and low birth weight. Humans are the only natural host for rubella. A vaccine is available. Um, this disease is highly contagious, and this is the problem. 40% of the infected individuals fail to develop symptoms, but can still spread the virus. The prevention and treatment is that the vaccine attenuated, uh, a vaccine made of attenuated virus is available, given at an early age, but not to pregnant women. And there is no antiviral therapy available. What I also wanted to mention to you is fifth disease. It's based on the old practice uh, to number childhood rashes. So number one would be rubiola, two, scarlet fever, three, rubella, four, Duke's disease, which is a mild disease with fever and rash, may be caused by an enterovirus. Number five is erythra infectiosum, and number six is exanthinum, uh, cerbitern, which is uh, roseola. Now, so the fifth disease <clears throat> is caused by parvovirus B19. It's a non-enveloped, single-stranded DNA virus. The symptoms are fever, malaise, head and muscle aches, diffuse redness of cheeks. They almost appear slapped. The rash subsides in about two weeks, and the joint pains may also appear. So you can see there the kid's joints are maybe a little bit painful, and this patient did have that sort of like uh, little rash on the face, okay? the slapped face appearance. It can infect bone marrow. It can cause an aplastic crisis where you basically have no red or white cell production in persons with sickle cell anemia or other types of anemias. It can cause in 10% of the pregnant women a spontaneous abortion, meaning a miscarriage. The epidemiology is that usually occurs in children and young adults. There is no real information for the prevention and treatment. It's sort of like just make them comfortable, reduce the fever, and move on. Rosciola, uh, you have the symptoms of high fevers. When I say this, we're talking about 105, which can also trigger convulsions. The fever leaves and a transitory red rash appears mainly on the chest and abdomen. The causative agent is a herpes virus, usually herpes virus type 6. There's not much information on the pathogenesis. The children do not appear ill. Um, it's common in infants six months to three years old. Prevention, it's just reduce the risk of seizures, sponge down the body to keep it cooler, use antipyretics, for example, aspirin, to keep the fever below 102. The next area we're going to deal with is dermal warts. This is caused by a, a papillomavirus. Usually they're considered like small tumors. Uh, there may be mul multiple nipple-like structures on the skin or mucous membrane. From the papovirus uh, family, you're going to have the papilloma papilloma virus. Yeah, you can laugh. That's okay. They're non-enveloped, double-stranded DNA virus. There's over 50 different types that affect, infect humans. Usually, the infection is via skin abrasions, and it can be transmitted from formites, or it can be transmitted sexually. Human papillomaviruses, uh, as an STD, can lead to cervical cancer. Infected skin cells grow abnormally and develop into a wart. We have also plantar warts. Now, the, these warts are similar, except they occur on the plantar region, that is the bottom, the sole of the foot. They spread out laterally, and they spread deep due to the pressure of the foot. Now, if you remember, the foot has a thick layer of skin, and so it's going to be something that they have to kind of core out, usually burning it out by chemical or uh, electrically. Uh, if it's something where it may be on the foot also, it may be partially uh, frozen and then cored out. But the virus may still exist in adjacent skin cells, so that makes it difficult at times, and you have to treat it multiple times before you get it all eradicated. And it's the papillomavirus. And <clears throat> now we deal with fungal skin diseases. Excuse me. Mycoses are diseases caused by fungi. Candida albicans is a common yeast that can live harmlessly as normal flora on the skin, but can become a problem 
if it inv invades deeper layers of the skin and subcutaneous tissue. Now, you'll see on page 595 various names of infections uh, caused by this. Now, basically, Tinea capitis is a fungal infection of the scalp. Tinea barbi is an infection, fungal infection of the beard. Tinea auxiliaries is the fungal infection of the armpit. Tinea corp uh, cor corporis is a uh, fungal infection of the body. Tinea crucis is a fungal infection of the groin. Tinea pedis is an infection, fungal infection of the feet. Tinea refers to worm. That's where we get into um, some of these infections that can be called ringworm, but they're not ringworm, a worm. They're really just a fungal infection in the skin. So we're going to deal first with superficial cutaneous mycosis. And if you take a look on 2224, what you see here, and I added this for clarification, uh, is what you would see on the foot, and then you see a particular type of this uh, fungal organism uh, in a photomicrograph. Some infections will have no symptoms. Others will have a bad odor, itching, and a rash. And uh, ringworm can lead to the loss of patches of hair. Sometimes the rash will occur distant from the infected area. This is a uh, dermatophytid. The id reaction is really an allergy uh, to products made by the infecting fungus. Keep in mind that what the fungus is going to do is it's going to produce enzymes that dissolve uh, keratin and other uh, substances in the skin so that it will absorb these in to feed off of. Okay. Usually, skin and hair are resistant to fungal infection, but some fungi have the keratinase, and this is the enzyme that dissolves keratin in the skin cells and hair follicles, and uses the dissolved material as nutrients. And the fungal products can dissolve into the dermis of the skin and trigger an allergic reaction. <clears throat> Excuse me. Different fungal strains exist, but fungal invasions are also dependent on the surface, skin, hair, um, for example, the surface moisture, whether you have tight clothing or shoes that allow for basically the moisture buildup. Now, prevention and treatment, powders and other antifungal compounds help as well uh, by not only fighting the infection, but also reducing moisture levels at the site of infection. Nail infections usually require removal of the nail or oral medication, such as antifungal drugs, to basically neutralize the persistence of it, because usually the nail infections are going to be at the nail bed, not merely just in that nail proper. The nail bed is where new nail cells are being made. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, Malaysia furfur. This is the Tinea versa color that you see. It's generally considered harmless, can cause skin, uh, skin condition of this patchy scaliness and alternations of pigmentation. Light skin patients get dark spots. Dark skin patients get light patches. Um, this particular fungi can form yeast-like structures and hyphae will be present. So in other words, you get the round single cells, that's the yeast-like formations, as well as the uh, strands of the hyphae that exist. AIDS patients may have a rash of malacia forming pus-filled pimples. Remember, the AIDS patients are immunocompromised and as a result are going to be much more susceptible to some of these diseases that we have means to keep in balance or in check. Intravenous feeding of uh, lipid-containing solutions uh, can lead to malacia infecting internal organs. This is a critical point. If the, the uh, malacia travels from the puncture wound site and gets internally, then you're going to have some serious issues. Candidia albicans. Now, you see this first picture on the um, left there. There's a sad situation with a little infant who's probably screaming uh, his brains out because it hurts so much. Uh, diaper rash. The issue is that this particular uh, yeast, <coughs> excuse me, fungi, can invade deep layers of the skin in the subcutaneous layers. Um, Candida albicans can form both yeast and pseudo structures, and you see that on the right side of the picture. 
Well, that just about covers this particular chapter. I encourage you to review the microassessment, future opportunities, uh, review the diseases in review on page 598, as well as the chapter summary. From here, we're going to move into chapter 21 and infections of the respiratory system. Now, what I encourage everyone to do, first and foremost, is to review uh, basically figure 21.1. And that's important to review in this diagram. There was a little image there. Don't worry about it. It's an, ar it's an artifact. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Keep in mind that the respiratory system what you have here is a major portal of entry. The eyes, the nose, and the respiratory going into the mouth. The factors that favor infection, warm, dark, moist, high carbon dioxide levels, lower oxygen levels, generally high levels in gas exchange. What is the function of the respiratory system? Well, gas exchange, phonation, the sinuses are present to lighten the weight of the skull, and the nose is also for chemical analysis. Keep in mind also you're going to have the eustachian tube, which is basically a tube that equalizes pressure between the outside air and the middle ear cavity. Also, you have the divisions. Um, the upper respiratory system is including the conjunctiva, nasolacrimal, middle ear, sinuses, mastoid air cells, as well as the nose, throat, throat and epiglottis. The lower respiratory system includes the larynx, trachea, bronchial branch, bronchioli, alveoli, and the pleura. Also keep in mind that dust cells, these are macrophages that move along the alveoli and airways to prevent pneumonia from destroying by destroying any foreign microbe. In other words, those are the sentinels that are maintaining the sterile environment of the alveoli. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the mucociliary escalator. Mucus, which is a glycoprotein material that keeps membranes of the respiratory system moist and produced by goblet cells. The transport of foreign matter, and when I mean by foreign matter, it may be very small particles. They may include viruses. They may include dust particles that have bacteria on them, things like that. Basically, they will, as you breathe in, fall onto the mucus, stick to it, and get transported by the ciliated cells, such as the pseudostratified epithelial tissue, and move it out of the uh, trachea, and move it up to the throat where it's either spit out or swallowed. You also have a similar mucociliary escalator that moves material uh, basically through uh, the nose down to the back of the throat, okay? You're going to have the transport, transport of matter out of the mastoids, middle ear, nasolacrimal duct, sinuses, lungs, and basically it will be destroyed by enzymes or the acids of the stomach. And this escalator is extremely important, but it can be paralyzed by certain chemicals. For example, cigarette smoke. Just keep that in mind. As for the normal microbiota, uh, microbiota uh, mastoid air cells, middle ear, sinuses, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli are normally sterile. The nasal cavity, the nasal pharynx, and um, the larynx, the nasal pharynx and the pharynx in general, are colonized by various bacteria species. And you might see some of them on your tables. Okay. On 21.1. I may have missed that table. There it is. No, there it is. Okay. So you want to keep in mind that you do have some organisms that are around. Now, the eyes normally have no bacteria on the conjunctiva, and this is due to the presence of lysozyme, the salt content in the tears, and the blinking reflex that wipes away attachments. Keep in mind that lysozyme will break down the cell walls of bacteria. Okay. So let's move into the bacterial infections of the upper respiratory system first. And of course, the first one we're going to deal with 
is the Streptococcus pyogens. Now, in this, we're going to get into strep throat. And I refer you to 21.3, the table 21.3. Pyogenic means cause of the production of purulent discharge, otherwise known as pus. This is not to be confused with pyrogenic, which is fever producing. You can see here streptococcus pyogen colonies on blood agar. You're having basically beta hemolysis, breaking down of the red blood cells. And you have to keep in mind that streptococcus py uh, pyogens has a variety of very, very important virulence factors. Uh, the C5 peptidase, uh, you have hyaluronic acid capsule, which inhibits phagocytosis. Also interfering with phagocytosis is the M protein. Also interfering with opsonization is protein G. And then you have the exotoxins, which can lead to uh, basically um, scarlet fever, toxic shock, even the flesh-eating faciliitis. And then you have the streptolysins O and S, which will lyse leukocytes and erythrocytes. That partly accounts for the beta hemolysis that you saw earlier. <clears throat> there are a variety of other tissue degrading enzymes as well. Here you can see part of the wall of the streptococci with the presence of proteins G, F, M, as well as lipotechoic acid. All right, so let's talk about strep throat, otherwise known as streptococcal pharyngitis. You have a red sore throat, often with pus and tiny hemorrhages, enlarged and tender lymph nodes in the neck, abscess formation involving the tonsils, and sometimes can lead to rheumatic fever and glomerular nephritis. Remember what glomerular nephritis is, okay? That's back in the last chapter we talked about. The causative agent is Streptococcus pyogens, Lansfield Antigens Group A and B, um, excuse me, Lansfield Antigen Group A. They also have a beta hemolytic vir virulence factor, which basically destroys, as we said, it's an enzyme that lyses or destroys red blood cells. You'll see this on a blood agar as clear zones. Now, the pathogenesis, it's basically the various virulence factors protect S pyogens from the host immune defense as well as assist in tissue damage. Now, this is where you're sitting there going, hmm, sounds like all the cards are stacked in favor of strep throat. Yeah, a lot of them do sound like that. That's why we get into use of antibiotics in an intelligent way here. This can lead to scarlet fever, which is a complication of streptococcal pharyngitis due to streptococcal pyrogenic exotoxin. This erythrogenic toxin causes the redness of the skin and the whitish coating of the tongue. You have the uh, disorder complication called Quincy, and that is a painful abscess that develops around one of the tonsils. And by the way, if you've forgotten what some of this is we're talking about, the whitish coating of the tongue, etc. If you take a look at page 531, that very first picture, you're seeing the case there of the scarlet fever appearing. Redness of the skin, whitish coating of the tongue, etc., etc., etc. Also, another complication that can occur later on during uh, this strep throat is glomerular nephritis and rheumatic fever. Acute rheumatic fever, the symptoms include fever, joint pain, chest pain, nodules under the skin, rash, uncontrollable jerky movements, and this is due to inflammatory processes of the heart, skin, joint, and brain. Usually rest and anti-inflammatory drugs can help, but this disorder can be fatal and can lead to damage on the left side of the heart, where you will end up with the formation of subacute bacterial endocarditis. Chorea, uh, that's C-H-O-R-E-A, not to be confused with the nation chorea. The chorea are symptoms that manifest as jerky movements, and this is due to brain damage as other symptoms of rheumatic fever begin to subside. So the person starts having these twitchiness and jerky movements. Also acute post-streptococcal -strep uh, glomerular nephritis, which we've talked about before. The onset is about 
Oh, by the way, there is that image that I was talking with you about before. Here is a situation with a rheumatic heart. And here is a situation with a glomerular nephritis. The onset of this is going to be 7 to 21 days after initial infection. The symptoms, fever, fluid retention, high blood pressure. Okay, remember, what are you having? You're having these immune complexes come in. The antibody, the complement, the streptococcus uh, antigen present. <clears throat> excuse me. And so they're going to tend to block up the glomerulus. The filtration site is blocked up. Puffiness around the eyes, that's fluid retention. Swollen ankles, fluid retention. You're going to see a, a great decrease in urinary output. Okay, you will find blood protein in the urine too. Due to the streptococcal antigens accumulating in the kidney glomeruli, along with the antibody complexes, these are going to trigger an inflammatory reaction and kidney disease. The patient has to be very closely watched at this point. Epidemiologically, this is easily spread by respiratory droplets produced from yelling, coughing, or sneezing. Epidemics of strep throat can originate from uh, food contamination by S. pyrogens carriers. You can also have poor ventilation or crowding, which will enhance the transmission in infection. So, poor ventilation and crowding, refugee centers, uh, places where maybe daycare centers, public schools, military barracks, things like that. If there's poor ventilation or if there's really a close confinement of these individuals, that's when uh, just one can lead to many individuals having that same disease. Moving on, we go to diphtheria. And diphtheria, the symptoms are sore throat, fever, fatigue, and malaise. Later, a gray, a whitish gray membrane composed of clotted blood, leukocytes, and epithelial cells will form on the tonsils. Okay? And they can form also in the throat and nasal cavity. This can become loosened and block airflow. It can lead to choking. Heart and kidney failure and paralysis will follow these symptoms. What is the causative agent? Cornibacterium diphtheriae. It is a non-motile, non-spore-forming, gram-positive bacteria. And it produces the exotoxins of AB. Um, this AB toxin, basically how it works is that it inhibits protein synthesis by e uh, inactivating the elongation factor. It kills the local cells in the throat and the toxin can be carried in the bloodstream to other organs. And here you see a diagram of uh, the process of the diphtheria toxin. So once you have the separation of the A, B, you have the A component, that subunit, attacking, uh, basically inactivating the protein synthesis uh, by attaching to the ADS ribosomes, okay? And it causes cell death. And here is the table 21.4 to describe further about this. Um, by the way, the exotoxin is held together by disulfide bonds. So the A toxin, which inactivates the elongation factor, is liberated by the reduction from acidification in the vacuole by hydrolysis. So in other words, if you remember here, the toxin as an AB uh, combo attaches to the receptor and the cell membrane of a susceptible cell, you get the endocytosis, and then you get the endosome having a detachment. And usually this is by, well, you may have the presence of a lysosome, but that A subunit's not going to be disabled. It will eventually get freed, and then it will separate out and then inactivate the ribosome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Humans are primary reservoir of this uh, bacteria. Carriers can also exist. And also the bacteria can exist in chronic skin ulcers. This is called, referred to as cutaneous diphtheria in some indigent populations. Now there is a vaccine. It's made from a toxoid, which is basically a formalin treatment of the diphtheria toxin, and they inactivate it. And that is an injected, that's part of the um, DPT or DTP um, vaccine. The D is for the diphtheria. Let's go to pink eye, and that is conjunctivitis. 
Uh, the symptoms are increased tears, redness of the conjunctitis, swelling of the eyelids, sensitivity to bright light, and large amounts of pus being produced. And you see that there in that poor child. Okay, so you've got bacterial conjunctivitis there. The causative agent, and it must be distinguished from viral infections because there are viral causes for pink eye. But usually the bacterial ones will be Haemophilus influenzae with a gram-negative rod, Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is a gram-positive encapsulated diplococcus, and sometimes Moraxella lactana, Neisseria gonorrhoe, also sometimes due to contaminated uh, contact lenses, you have a bacillus species present. Most of the time, the pathogenesis is that this is an airborne respiratory droplets and contaminated hands. And the passage may be due to children, especially in crowding, such as in schools. The prevention is to remove the child from the school and isolate others from the contamination. Eye drops or ointments with antimicrobial medications are usually what helps. Ear infections, oh yes, if you're a parent, you know about, you've heard about it, uh, otitis media. In the middle ear, you have to think about this. The only means that you're going to have uh, to maintain pressure balance between the outside environment and the middle ear area is basically through the eustachian tube. Now, what happens is you can have otitis media or otitis externa. This is the uh, external ear canal, and that's not considered part of the respiratory system, but is considered part of the skin ecosystem. In the symptoms, you'll have earache pain, sometimes very, very intense. Uh, you will have also vomiting. An eardrum rupture is also possible. The vomiting is usually caused because the pressure builds up in there and acts on the vestibular, the sense of balance that uh, causes eventually uh, emesis, the vomiting response. You will have drainage of the fluid in the external canal if there has been an eardrum rupture. The causative agent is usually Haemophilus influenzae, which is a gram-negative rod, Streptococcus pneumoniae, a gram-positive encapsulated diplococcus, Mycoplasma pneumoniae, Streptococcus pyrogens, or Staphylococcus aureus. Mostly this is airborne from respiratory droplets or contaminated hands. Many times occurs at the same time with conjunctivitis. It tends to affect children. Preceding or concomitant, concomitant uh, viral infections is very common for the otitis media and sinusitis. Um, as virus will damage the mucociliary mechanisms. So what happens is the means to get these organisms out is going to be paralyzed because of the presence of the virus. The prevention or treatment, basically antibiotics, amphicillin. Now you may know that they'll do what is called a, a ventilation tube. Um, a tympano uh, tubular process. And what happens there is this. What doctors feared for many years, what happened was they used to put the little tubes in the ears. The membrane would eventually heal and the tube would get pushed out or popped out. What happened when you started having uh, otitis media being treated with antibiotics is that these organisms developed the resistance. And if you had a kid with a lot of cases of otitis media, eventually they didn't have any other choices. Now, keep in mind, your station tube is inflamed. Very little air is present. These organisms are going to be present. So what they would do is put the tube in so that the pus would drain out, oxygen would be present, and the pressure reestablished and balanced out. And uh, hopefully the organism would die out and the patient would resume a normal life. Sometimes they would have to have a reinsertion of these ventilation tubes. And, you know, they, they would try all sorts of antibiotics and they wouldn't work. Uh, let's go into now viral infections of the upper respiratory system. Yep, the rhinovirus, the cold. Symptoms are scratchy throat, nasal discharge, malaise, Headache, cough, but there's no fever. Now, you have to understand this. Now, rhinoviruses are members of the picornovirus family. They're non enveloped single stranded RNA virus. Uh, the last report, when I first had this done, it was about over 100 different rhinoviruses. The best I've heard now is that it's up to about 160. 
So is that why there's no uh, vaccine? Yep. They've been working on trying to formulate that. And the way the uh, uh, attachment of the virus is, it makes it very, very difficult to find a consistent site where they can basically make a permanent lifelong vaccine against the cold. That's why we jokingly say, you know, what have you done? Oh, I've conquered the common cold. Yay. And someone gets a Nobel Prize. Well, it's a much harder process than that. The virus will attach to the respiratory epithelial cells and infect these cells. Infected cells cease their ciliary motion and later sloth off. Injury causes the release of inflammatory mediators and stimulates nervous reflexes such as sneezing, nasal swelling, increased nasal secretions. Interestingly enough, humans are the only reservoir. Close contact causes the transfer, and transmission by wiping eyes leads to transport of the virus via the nasolacrimal duct. The best prevention? Hand washing. An antiviral drug, Plecarnonil, shortens the duration of the symptoms, but there's really been nothing that's full blast, complete treatment for the common cold. Okay? It's basically... As most doctors would say, you're just going to have to live with it for a couple of days. Adenoviral pharyngitis. Here you have a fever. The symptoms also include sore throat, severe cough, swollen lymph nodes, pus on the tonsils, throat and conjunctitis, infrequently can lead to pneumonia. Causative agent is an adenovirus. There are over 45 types. They can be inactivated by chlorine heat at the level of 56 degrees Celsius or more. So we're talking, you know, 120, 130, 140 Fahrenheit or other disinfectants. So it can be controlled. It can remain infectious for long periods of time and can be transmitted by formites. So that's why disinfectants are going to be extremely important in this battle. Humans are the only source of infection. Once inside cells, the virus multiplies inside the nucleus. It's very prevalent in school children. During summertime, can be transmitted in poorly chlorinated swimming pools, can be spread by respiratory droplets, excuse me, and transmission is favored in crowded conditions. Again, situations like um, refugee centers, um, very crowded schools, or camps where the kids are all inside for long periods of time, etc. Prevention and treatment. There is a vaccine. It's an attenuated virus that was formerly used, but is no longer used. Patients get well on their own. Now, moving from there, we're going to move into bacterial infections of the lower respiratory system. And this is where we're going to have to compare the different types of pneumonia. And I refer you to table 21.7. You have to understand that pneumonia is a generalized term. What you're seeing here are neutrophils fighting against, against Streptococcus pneumoniae. Pneumonia, as I said, is a very generalized term, means an inflammation of the lungs accompanied by filling of the air sacs with fluids such as pus and blood. If you go to the table here, you're going to see different pathogens that will cause this. And we'll go over this in a second, but I want to bring up to you these several different other uh, very important images. Here you have the uh, basically the certain types of mycoplasma pneumonia, and they attach into the cells of the respiratory epithelium, and they're going to affect the cilia that would cause the sweeping motion to get the the uh, bacteria out. Here. You have a chest x-ray. And if you notice, and keep in mind now, x-rays normally don't give you a lot of details as compared to something like an MRI or something else like that. But what you do see on the right side, normal x-ray film after the person recovers. The lung is mostly soft tissue, empty space. Therefore, the x-rays should go right through, okay? If you have a buildup of fluid and other uh, material, then you're going to get a cloudiness appearing on the x-ray. 
which you see on the left side there. Notice the left lung. The left lung, you can barely tell if there's any empty space there because really what's there is a greater density, which is uh, causing uh, the x-rays to be obstructed in passing through. Okay. So let's go over this. Pneumococcal pneumonia. Symptoms, cough, fever, single shaking chill, rust-colored sputum, rust-colored means blood, shortness of breath and chest pain, usually caused by streptococcus pneumoniae. These are the encapsulated strains only. Incubation is about one to three days. Accounts for about 60% of the pneumonia cases and inhaled respiratory droplets are the means of getting this. Encapsulated cells enter into the alveoli, multiply rapidly and causing inflammatory response. Carriers will pass on the disease. Usually, the risk is increased with impaired health, such as uh, alcoholism, narcotic use, individuals with respiratory viral diseases, such as influenza. The prevention, well, they have a conjugate vaccine available. This stimulates the anti-capsule antibodies. The treatment can also be treated with um, basically erythromycin or penicillin. Klebsiella pneumonia, chills, fever, cough, chest pain, very bloody mucoid sputum. So mucoid basically meaning extremely thick, viscous. It's not thin, watered out. It's much more thick. And Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is enterobacterium, which has an incubation of one to three days, is the causative agent. And this pneumonia will cause death of lung tissue and rapid formation of lung abscesses. Even with treatment, permanent damage to the lung can occur. Normally, this type of bacteria is part of the normal flora of the intestine. These types attack the very young, the very old, alcoholics, nursing home patients, and others uh, that happen to be debilitated by other diseases. Without treatment, the mortality is 50 to 80 percent. Prevention and treatment. Disinfect the environment. Antimicrobial medication where necessary. No vaccine is available. Klebsiella strains have been found to be antibiotic resistant. Some have ESBL. In other words, a much more sophisticated beta-lactamase uh, resistance, and so they're resistant to cephalosporins. Mycoplasm pneumonia. The symptoms are a gradual onset of cough, fever, sputum production, headache, fatigue, muscle aches. The mycoplasm pneumonia, basically mycoplasms are, are pleomorphic. They lack a cell wall. They have slow growth and they have the requirement of an aerobic metabolism. The cells attach to uh, the respiratory epithelium. They inhibit ciliary motion and the cells will later die. This is spread by aerosolized droplets of respiratory secretions, so cough, sneeze, things like that. And it accounts for about 20% of the bacterial pneumonias. The prevention and treatment, this is gonna be difficult. There's no vaccine available. No cell wall antibiotics work, so penicillins are out. Bacteriostatic antibiotics will only slow the progress. Uh, usually they're uh, tetracycline and erythromycin. And you can see the mucoid appearance here from the Klebsiella. This is grown on a plate, and you have that mucoid nature of the bacteria growth. Also, this is mycoplasma pneumonia colleagues, and it looks like a sort of a fried egg appearance. Okay, here we have anthrax. This is the inhalation version, okay? There is a gastrointestinal one. This is due to eating contaminated meat. A, a cutaneous one where you have the blackened infectious site form. They will form eschcars. So what do you see here? You see the medastium, uh, a widening occurring. This is often due, referred to as pleural effusion, but usually there are no infiltrates. Basically the lungs are being reduced in their volume capacity uh, what happens is there's going to be a lot uh, greater pressure uh, due to the presence of the bacteria. So let's go over uh, anthrax. Fatigue, fever, aches, cough. Later, a high fever, labored breathing and shock. 
A widening metastasis is accompanied by severe respiratory distress, dyspnea and cyanosis. Remember cyanosis, that you're going to have that kind of dusty bluish appearance on the skin. Inhaled anthrax leads to septic shock. The cutaneous form leads to skin lesions. Gastrointestinal will occur when people eat meat infected uh, from infected animals. Now, by the way, I apologize. There should have been a blue background on a couple of these slides. But anyways, moving on forward, you can read this. The causative agent is Bacillus anthraxis, is a gram-positive spore-forming rod. And what you see are what they call the rod-shaped. Uh, they will be attached to each other. It's kind of like a boxcar appearance. And you see in the center, uh, basically, what would be the uh, formation in some cases, uh, the white spheres are the formation of the spores. Uh, the white spheres inside the box cars are, are going to be the nuclei. Now, the pathogenesis. Again, it's an AV toxin. Two factors. An edema factor, which causes the cells to overproduce fluid, which accounts for some of the buildup of fluid in the lungs. A lethal factor in it activates proteins involved in cell signaling. From the lungs, the bacteria are engulfed by macrophages and transported to the lymph nodes. The bacteria break out of the macrophages and enter the bloodstream. The immune system is debilitated by the toxin. Epidemiologically, usually this is via spores. Now, the spores can come from bioweapons or spores from people who work with domestic or wild plant-eating animals, so deer, sheep, goats, cattle, swine, buffalo, okay? The bioweapons, this has always been the big fear, and the Amera anthrax case, which was the situation where somebody distributed anthrax in the mail, and it got to, um, I believe, uh, one of the buildings in Congress. They had to decontaminate, as well as it got to a variety of mail sorting stations, and even an innocent lady out in Connecticut uh, received it and got ill and died from it. Prevention is usually ciprofloxin, cipro or doxycycline in, in company with one or two of the other antibiotics, rampafin, vancomycin, penicillin, amphicillin, chloramphalicol, imipipin, uh, clindamycin, or clathromycin. There is a vaccine that exists that's used mostly by the military and veterinarians, and unfortunately has some side effects. There is the Eshkar, that's from the cutaneous anthrax, and the next disease we are going to deal with is pertussis, otherwise known as whooping cough. As you can see, there is the B pertussis, the uh, Borella, per, excuse me, the Bordetella pertussis, which is a gram-negative rod, getting in between the ciliated epithelial cells. Here you have a ciliated epithelial cell, and you can see the cluster of B pertussis present. So let's talk about this. The symptoms are a runny nose followed in about several days with bouts of violent coughing, some severe enough to rupture small blood vessels in the eyes. You will also have uh, vomiting and convulsions possible. Now, the Bordetella pertussis produces an AB toxin. Remember that that's where you have one component that gets inside the cell, the other component does the chaos inside of the cell. The A toxin component creates overproduction of cycl cyclic AMP, and subsequent overproduction of mucus and inhibition of phagocytes and lymphocytes to function. It spreads by respiratory secretions. It's classically a disease of children. Here's the table 21.8 for review. Disease control has usually been now by vaccination. There is an acellular vaccine that is used to control the disease. If infection occurs, erythromycin is used during the early stages of the disease. Okay, uh, pertussis, that's part of the P on the DTaP uh, vaccine, uh, which basically is for uh, the different components there. You've got tetanus and you've got diphtheria, and then you have also the acellular component for uh, pertussis, okay? And adults, interestingly enough, are supposed to get those boosters, but sometimes they fail to and become susceptible to these diseases. Here, the next point is probably one of the most scary diseases that's out there, and that's tuberculosis. And what you see here is the incidence of TB disease in the United States from 1976 
2013. And what you see is what? A decline. But it's not totally eradicated. And this is reported cases per 100,000 of the population. So in the process of about, let's say about 20, 30 years, 35 years, you've had this continued decline, but that doesn't mean it goes away. The symptoms are chronic fever, weight loss, cough, and sputum production. The causative agent is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Remember that this is an unusual organism. The cell wall has a high lipid content, and to visualize it, you have to do an acid-fast staining. So these are acid-fast rod-shaped cells. Formerly, you also had another type of TB that was out there caused by Mycobacterium bovis, bovis as in cattle. This was from infected milk cattle, usually from an unpasteurized milk. That's why even to this day, unpasteurized milk is uh, sort of a bane for public health workers uh, because basically it could cause some individuals to get a type of TB. What you have is the situation where you're going to have colonization of the alveoli. And this causes an inflammatory response. The bacteria cells are ingested by the macrophages. The organisms are going to survive and get transported to lymph nodes, lungs, and other body tissues. Later, a tubercle bacilli will multiply and granulomas, which are localized collection of inflammatory cells, will form consisting of encasement of the infected macrophages by other lymphocytes and macrophages. Okay, so basically you're forming this in uh, basically this casium or this case, fibrous capsule, this tubercle will form. Okay, that's kind of good, isn't it? Granulomas of tuberculosis are called tubercles. The problem, there is a condition called caseous necrosis. This is the death of the lung tissue leading to the formation of a cheesy-like material. The tubercle bacteria can break out of the tubercle and lysis lice of the uh, macrophages leads to the release of uh, the macrophage digestive enzymes that surround uh, the tissue. If the process occurs in a bronchi, it will lead to a cavity, a large lung defect, and further spread of the bacteria. What you have to understand, and you see this down at the bottom, the tubercle is rupturing. And you have free mycobacterium that are now going to pass through the airway. They can also then migrate back up into the blood. Okay. Now, all of that has been discussed. Let's talk about epidemiology for a minute. Transmission is almost entirely by the respiratory system. Okay. You can see the cavities that have formed in this x-ray. You also see the boundary of necrotic area. And that is an actual view of a tubercle. <clears throat> now, the Mantoux test is a tuberculin test. It's used to detect TB-infected patients. They react to what's called a PPD, a purified protein derivative. And this is an example of it. Now, you get these tests. They put a little bit of the PPD in. They come back and see you in a couple of days. If you have a big swelling, that's an indication you may have either TB, could be active, could be inactive, but your immune system is reacting to this PPD. Then they send you for an X-ray and further tests. Now, there is one other thing I want to bring up. In some countries, they have BCG vaccine, Bacille Calmet Guerin, which was derived from M. bovis. Here's the problem. It can lead to a false positive Mantu test. Those people in certain Caribbean nations, European nations, etc., had ma been mandated to take the BCG in their youth. Then they have to basically carry a card around because anytime they get the Mantu text, they're going to test, they're going to come up positive. Also, the BCG cannot be used for immunocompromised patients. It will lead to a, perhaps an outbreak of TB. Rampapin and isonazid are used in combination to treat infections, but second-level antibiotics can be used as well. You want to keep in mind that the second-level drugs are less effective, more toxic, usually causing liver damage, and more expensive. 
And I believe I've talked about this before when I talked about antibiotics. We have MDR and XDR. These are nightmares. And what I mean by that is you have to understand that at a point in our society, all we had to control TB was to isolate the patients and put them into what they called sanitariums. These were places where individuals had tuberculosis but didn't spread it. The problem is today, the drugs which have been able to treat individuals and basically let them return back to society, those drugs are not as effective anymore. MDR is multi-drug resistant. That means it's resistant to ramfofen and isonazad. XDR is extreme, extensively drug resistant TB. It is resistant to ramfofen and isonazad and three or more second level drugs. More recently, in 2012, bedalaquinil was a new drug approved to treat MDR TB. What you have to understand today is in certain parts of the world, uh, MDR is a lot more prevalent and XDR is beginning to show up in many other places of the world. And that has public health officials quite scared that we may have to re, uh, return to the days where tuberculosis is a very serious communicable disease, uh, especially when we have high density populations in urban centers and where individuals may have problems uh, fulfilling the normal regimen of the antibiotic treatment. Next one we're going to deal with, Legionnaire's disease. And this is stained with a fluorescent antibody. Because you can see this uh, organism. Um, the causative agent is Legionella pneumophilia, which is a gram-negative gamma proteobacterium. Its incubation takes two to ten days. This was an interesting disease because it was first really detected at an American Legion convention. That's why they call it Legionnaire's disease. In Philadelphia, PA, in 1976, the individual suffered muscle aches, headaches, fever, cough, shortness of breath, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Sadly, some died. Now, how did it occur? It seemed to have been acquired by breathing aerosolized water that was contaminated with the organism. This was something that you had a lot of the air conditioning systems at that time had coolant systems and they didn't treat the water. But as the coolant systems would work, you'd have this fine mist that would be kicked up out of it. And uh, these individuals were breathing in uh, these uh, aerosolized water particles with the organisms. Uh, these organisms will infect macrophages and alveoli cells leading to the death of these cells. Basically, from an epidemiological view, this is widespread in warm water, hot water systems, coolant towers, and low chlorine systems. No evidence of person-to-person -person transmission has been found with this disorder. Here is another fluorescent view, and here is the table 2110. What has been found is that there is resistance by these organisms to many penicillins and some cephalosporins. The prevention and treatment. Well, treatment, erythromycin and ramfapin to avoid water aerosols that are contaminated and regular cleaning and disinfection of uh, the coolant and humidifying systems is necessary. Now we're going to move into viral infections of the lower respiratory system. The key one that you want to keep in mind is influenza, and I'm going to spend some time in that, and I encourage you also to review issues about influenza. That is, why do we have to keep getting a flu shot each year? And why is it that some of the flu shots don't always work? Remember that you're going to be a healthcare provider, and you're going to have patients asking you this. Also, I did include a paper that they're trying to make some progress in a single one-time shot to treat influenza. I want to encourage you to take time to read it. What are the symptoms? Fever, muscle aches, headaches, sore throat, cough, nasal congestion. It is caused by the influenza virus, which is an orthomyxovirus. Incubation takes one to two days. This is an RNA, single-stranded, negative sense, segmented meaning that you have multiple pieces of RNA. Uh, it is an enveloped virus, and it has hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins 
in the envelope that assist in the implantation and the uh, release from the cell of the virus, okay? Now, it sounds like a mouthful, but I want you to start thinking about this. The pathogenesis is that you are inhaling aerosolized respiratory secretions, basically droplets. It infects the respiratory epithelium as the hemagglutinin attaches to receptors on ciliated cells. Death usually occurs from bacterial secondary infections. Outbreaks occur every year. Outbreaks occur due to genetic changes, and I refer you back to figure 2124, which human immune systems are bypassed. Here is the images of the hemagglutin and neuraminidase. That's where you get into the H number and the N number. Notice the, uh, the RNA segments inside, and each RNA has a nucleoprotein with it, okay? What you have are the problems of antigenic drift and antigenic shift. Remember that this is a virus that has eight segments. Now, RNA can have a mutation, and that can lead to uh, some slight changes, and that's called antigenic drift. If you get them mixed up, think about this. Drift is kind of like slow process. From year to year, you might get a mutation. Antigenic shift, though, is much more profound and much more nasty. That's where you have the possibility of the development of pandemic influenza. On average, every 20 years, we get a pandemic, a worldwide influenza that can be devastating. It can cause death in, certain, in a lot of cases. We have, uh, about 100 years ago, we had the Spanish flu, which was really a uh, believed to be a swine flu variant. Different species, both birds and mammals, will have variants of influenza. And I remember seeing this, and you had H20, and you had uh, N16, and all these other ones. Yeah, you're not going to usually get it from moose or deer, but ducks and birds, avian flu, will have their flu interact uh, sometimes with pigs and sometimes what they'll find are fragments of the RNA that when they take the whole genome, it's part bird, part pig, part human. And sometimes those new recombinations make a very, very nasty type of flu that humans can't readily adapt to. And so it increases the risk of severe illness, if not death. Remember that you can have cells that can be co-infected at the same time with two different uh, uh, viruses, and then you're going to have this reassortment and mixing of the RNA sequences that come out with the new uh, virus, okay? Um, it's the genetic crosses with animal strains that usually enhance the virulence of human viruses. Here you have another example of this, antigenic drift, antigenic shift, and you see the differences in the combinations. Okay, before I get into RSV, I want to just finish up here with this. And that is the prevention and treatment. Vaccines prevent the outbreaks, but here's the part of the point. If they're going to deal with the possible uh, flu viruses that are faced with each year in Northern Hemisphere, they look to what's prevailing in the Southern Hemisphere at the time. And so they take those viruses and make up the vaccine. But we can always get a surprise in the process where a new virus with new combinations evolves in the process by mixing and matching, antigenic shift. And so suddenly the vaccine that's made may not prevent completely or only will give partial protection for the severity of the new virus strains that show up that season later on. Remember, it's winter southern hemisphere when it's summer northern hemisphere, and the decisions to make the vaccine are done usually in the summer to prepare for what would be winter for the northern hemisphere later on that year. I hope that make, makes sense. Neuraminidase inhibitors are zananamivir and ostelomivir are effective against both the A type and the B type viruses, but you're not going to see doctors handing them out random willy-nilly. And this is leads to problems because Tamiflu, which helps to uh, soften the blow of an infection, is not given out freely and easily 
Uh, that's so that the strains of viruses don't develop resistance quickly. And the same thing with neuraminidase inhibitors such as zanamivir and ostilovivir. Okay. Let's move now to RSV. Respiratory syncytial virus. The symptoms include runny nose, fever, wheezing, difficulty breathing, um, dusty color. You're having, again, poor oxygenation. The common symptom produced is bronchiolitis. You'll hear also a croup, a loud, high-pitched cough with a noisy inspiration due to the airway obstruction of the larynx. The RSV is a uh, paramyxovirus, it's single-stranded, negative sense RNA virus, it's non-segmented and enveloped, and produces syncytia, clumping of the cells. It infects via inhalation and infection of the respiratory tract epithelium and leads to the death and the sloughing off of the cells. Airway obstructions by sloughed off cells, mucus, and clotted plasma will occur. The risk of secondary infection is very high due to the damage of the mucociliary escalator. Outbreaks are common in late fall to early to uh, late spring. It's readily spread by older children and adults who have only mild symptoms. There is no vaccine. It is preventable by injections of monoclonal antibodies, that's felvimazemad, and uh, it's the prevention of nosocomial infections requires strict isolation. Okay. The next one is the hantavirus, or otherwise known as Hanta pulmonary syndrome. In the spring of 1993, an unusual respiratory distress uh, disease occurred in the Four Corners region of the United States. That's where the states of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico meet. Uh, first, the symptoms were very similar to some that had seen years beforehand. And what happened, literally, um, and by the way, excuse me, the symptoms include fever, muscle aches, vomiting, diarrhea, cough, shortness of breath, and shock. What happened, though, was they called this the sin nombre, or no name virus. They're all related hantavirus from the bunyavirus family. The genome is segmented. It is an RNA single-stranded negative sense virus. Guess what? Why they were occurring in that area was that there was uh, a lot of rodents at the time that were very prevalent at that particular time of the year. And rodents leave what rodents leave behind. Urine, feces, saliva to a degree. And how individuals were getting in getting infected was inhalation of the contaminated dust that had the contamination of the urine, saliva, feces of infected rodents. Although the mechanism was not totally completely understood, as it is not to this day, the virus spreads from the lungs to the systemic circulation. You have an inflammatory response to viral antigens, and that causes the lung capillaries to leak fluid, literally plasma going into the lungs. So you have the breakdown of the respiratory membrane and you have reduction in plasma fluid in the blood, which leads to rapid hypotension, uh, fluid in the lungs, and eventually shock and death. The mortality rate is 40%. This is a zoonosis from the rodent populations that happen to be in close proximity to humans. There is no evidence of person-to-person -person spread. The best prevention and treatment is to minimize exposure to rodent contaminated materials, dust, etc. And use of disinfectants to contaminated dust, uh, dust is very useful. Rodent control is absolutely essential. Okay. The next one that I wanted to include, and by the way, this is the total Hanta uh, virus pulmonary syndrome cases that were recorded between 96 roughly and 2013. Um, before we get into fungal infections, I wanted to stop here and just go over two other ones I thought would be very important. First is SARS, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. This is a coronavirus. Uh, the symptoms are flu-like and may include fever, myalgia, lethargy symptoms, cough, sore throat, and other nonspecific symptoms. The only symptom common to all patients appears to be a fever above 38C which is 100 degrees Fahrenheit. 
the sores may eventually lead to shortness of breath and or pneumonia. Now, it's a coronavirus originated from bats. Bats are believed to be the reservoir. Um, and the problem was that when this first occurred in China, this was found to be prevalent in wide, wild animals sold as food in local markets, particularly the bats. Experts believe the SARS may have actually first developed in animals because the virus was found in civets. Now, civets are a cat-like wild animal that's eaten as a delicacy in China, as well as eat consumption of other animals. What happens is that more severe damage caused by SARS may be due to the body's own immune system reacting in what is known as a cytokine storm. In other words, also it's referred to as a cytokine cascade, cascade or hyper cytokinemia. It's basically a very potentially fatal immune reaction consisting of a positive feedback loop between cytokines and white blood cells with highly elevated levels of various cytokines. And the lungs, for example, uh, basically you're going to have fluid buildup in them and immune cells such as macrophages may accumulate and eventually they block off the airways potentially killing the patient. Now this was discovered in uh, 2003. You're going to see some mention of it uh, in, in, on page 569, okay, in Southeast Asia, and that is in the future opportunities section. It spread globally. It was a pandemic. There were about 800 deaths, so it was about a 9.6 fatality rate. 9.6% uh, doesn't sound like much, but People were quite concerned in 03. There were no cases since 2004. It's been found to be spread mainly through contact with infected saliva or droplets of coughing. In general, close contact is a requirement to become infected. Close contact included living with or caring for a person who had SARS, breathing in air that, that an infected person had exhaled. But in some conditions, SARS was spread within an apartment building and to healthcare workers. At present, to date, there is no vaccine against SARS. Isolation and quarantine remain the most effective means to prevent the spread. Other preventative measures include hand washing, disinfection of surfaces of formites, wearing a surgical mask, avoiding contact with bodily fluids, washing the personal items of someone with SARS in hot soapy water, including eating utensils, dishes, bedding, etc., and keeping children with symptoms home from school. Neither antivirals nor antibiotics appeared to help. Treatment of SARS is largely supportive with antipyretics, supplemental oxygen, and mechanical ventilation as needed. Just to help you get a better handle on this, this was a, a uh, modern potential epidemic that had problems which demonstrated uh, to a lot of healthcare people and future healthcare workers such as you that sometimes patients are not cooperative and potentially infected carriers are not cooperative. There was one individual, uh, this is where literally there was a time, I believe it was Toronto, Canada. They thought they had a couple of cases. They were trying to isolate everything. And uh, they had actually the Minister of Health of Canada who was told to, I'm not going to use the bad word, but bleep off by a person who was contaminated and they told him he was not to leave the hospital. He told them to go take a hike. Uh, you, you can imagine what words he was using. I remember seeing it on TV going, I don't believe this. And this guy stormed right out of the hospital. He went home. They isolated him there. But this is part of the challenge with uh, quarantine. When we talk about microbiology and diseases, that you have uncooperative individuals. And what do you do with them? One other disorder that is similar is called MERS, which MERS-CoV. It stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It also is a coronavirus. It was also called camel flu. The symptoms may range from mild to severe. They include fever, cough, diarrhea, and shortness of breath. The disease is typically more severe in those with other health problems, and the illness can cause respiratory failure that requires mechanical ventilation and support in an intensive care unit. The virus appears to cause more severe diseases, uh, disease symptoms in older people, people with weakened immune systems, and those with chronic diseases such as renal disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, and diabetes. 
Again, this is uh, the causative agent was a coronavirus, which was different from the SARS coronavirus. It was called a beta coronavirus. The pathology is similar to SARS, the respiratory infection with possibility of a cytokine storm. The interesting outbreak occurred, it started in Saudi Arabia in 2012. And there was a great deal of concern about this because it could have been passed on during their Hajj, uh, which is when a lot of individuals come into Saudi Arabia for their Muslim, uh, it's part of their Muslim pilgrimage. And if you talk about several million people coming in at the same time you're having an outbreak of a disease that's not been completely tracked and can be possibly passed from person to person, that's a nightmare in itself. Again, this disease, uh, although it was a different coronavirus from SARS, appears to also have been started in bats, causes severe respiratory illness, and yet you have 50% fatalities. Although it's believed to have originated in bats, it was believed also to have been transmitted to camels sometime in the distant past. mers cov has been identified in dromedaries, yes, camels, in several countries, including Egypt, Oman, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia. Um, and they found mers cov specific antibodies, a finding that basically indicates that the animal had previously been infected with the disease. They've been uh, identified in dromedaries in the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia. The current scientific evidence suggests that dromedary camels are a major reservoir for MERS-CoV and an animal source of MERS infection in humans. Human-to-human -human transmission similar to SARS has been found also. Uh, by the way, no vaccine exists for this. Neither the combination of antivirals and interferons, ribavirin and interferon alpha 2A or interferon alpha 2B, nor corticosteroids has improved the outcomes. Treatment with MERS is largely supportive uh, care with antipyretics, supplemental oxygen, mechanical ventilation as needed. Prevention, here is the interesting one that comes up. Avoid uncooked camel products, including camel milk, meat, and contamination by camel urine. Use of hand cleaners after contact with camels and avoid sick camels. Personal protective equipment when visiting MERS patients, and that includes eye goggles, gloves, gown, and mask. Protections are very similar to what they dealt with with SARS. So gives you some perspective there. Okay, let's start dealing with the fungal infections of the lung. You have to keep in mind that serious lung diseases in healthy immunocompetent patients are rare. Serious lung diseases in immunocompromised patients are common. Symptomatic and asymptomatic infections that subside without treatment are very common. You have to keep in mind also that antifungal drugs are limited and the toxicity of the drugs may limit the drugs to external skin applications only, which we talked about in antifungal part of the antibiotics uh, lecture. The first one I'm going to deal with is Rif, uh, is basically valley fever. Uh, not Rif valley fever, excuse me, but valley fever. This is also called cocidiomycosis. And I turn your attention to table 21.4. You see some of the particles there. Now, symptoms. They're flu-like. Fever, cough, chest pain, loss of appetite and weight. Some experience tender nodules in the shin and pain in the joints. Small percentage develop chronic disease. Most recover in about a month. Symptoms and tissue injury mostly due to the host's immune responses to fungal antigens. Small percentage have caseation necrosis resulting in lung cavities. Can occur in more disseminated forms that is transport to skin, mucous membranes, brain, and other organs, especially with AIDS or other immunodeficiency uh, disorders. If you have an immunodeficient patient, and they may not have AIDS, but they may be, for example, under uh, extensive uh, anti-cancer treatment or immunosuppression because of a transplant of an organ, such as heart or kidney, uh, they need to be watched. The causative agent is coccidiosis immunis which is a dimorphic fungi, okay? Uh, you need to note the life cycle. You have the mold form in the soil. The hyphae make the arthrospores. And these structures, and you see in the top there, there is the 
arthrospores, these can become airborne. They enter the lung, uh, form a spear-formed structures, break and release endospores, which you can see, okay? Um, this is an interesting situation here because this is where you, when you have a patient with some unusual symptoms like this, you have to ask, where have you been? Have you traveled anywhere? Okay. Remember that these arthrospores become airborne, enter the lungs, form uh, sphere spores, break and release more endospores. The fungi are very common in the semi-arid desert areas of the Western Hemisphere. Hot, dry, dusty regions allow for airborne spores to be distributed. Rainfall promotes the growth of the fungus, and therefore the infection can occur by traveling through endemic areas. If you ask people, have you been to the Southwest? If you've been to certain areas, yeah, we drove through actually a dust storm in Arizona. That might be the reason that they have a coccidiosis imidus. Okay, you have to avoid breathing the dust in endemic areas. The treatment includes amphotericin B and fluconazole. The next disorder is going to be Spelunkner's disease, otherwise known as histoplasmosis. And you can see the hypsocapsulum, you can see uh, the uh, mold phase on the bottom part. You see the yeast phase in, in, in the uh, hypsocapsulum. Uh, in the cytoplasm of a macrophage. This is the geographic distribution of histoplasma capsulum. And basically, this is a mild respiratory symptoms. Most infections are asymptomatic. Less frequently will you see reports of fever, chest pain, cough, chronic mouth sores. Histoplasm capsulatum is a dimorphic fungi. The spores, the conidia, are inhaled with dust contaminated by bird or bat droppings. This is especially found, interestingly enough, in caves. That's why they call it the spelunker's disease. The spores are inhaled, change to a yeast base, and multiply in micro, uh, macrophages. Granulomas may form, and the disease spreads in individuals with AIDS or other immunodeficiencies. As you noticed, as I showed you there, this is mostly found in the United States and areas of Mississippi and the Ohio River drainage areas, and in the South Atlantic states. It's also found in the tropics and in temperate zones across the globe. The prevention is to avoid areas of bird, chicken, and bat droppings. The treatment is amphotericin B and fluconazole. Now the next one is interesting. This was formerly known as Pneumocystis carani. It is now called Pneumocystis gerovesi. Uh, gerovesi, yes. This is Pneumocystis pneumonia. Okay. Now, these are the cells you see. It's a fluorescent antibody stain. Okay. Here's the situation. Symptoms, gradual onset, shortness of breath, rapid breathing, non-productive cough, slight fever, or no fever at all a dusty color of the skin and mucous membranes. Now, this is a tiny fungus related to ascomycetes, pneumocystis gerovocdc. The cell walls are different, and thus this fungus is resistant to many antifungal drugs. Formerly, it was considered a protozoan, okay? The illness can result from latent infection or be newly acquired. The spores of P. gerovesi escape body defenses, enter the lungs, attach to alveolar cells, and multiply. The alveoli will fill up with fluid. The macrophages on fungal cells and later alveolar walls become thickened and scarred. This is where you're going to get the decrease in gas exchange, which accounts for the dusty color of the skin. The fungal strains for an epidemiological approach are, wide, are widespread in various animals and can persist in lungs as a latent infection. Normally, the infections are asymptomatic, and generally, you will have a, uh, basically, they'll be eliminated within a year. Sorry about the typo there. It's generally eliminated within a year. 
Uh, the disease occurs in immunocompromised patients because this is an opportunistic disease. It can cause severe lung infections in immunocompromised patients. So you might have someone who becomes immunocompromised later on who was formally exposed but has had these spores still in the lungs and as they, their immune function decreases, then the disease goes full blast. Now, as I said, this was formerly a disease that was a leading cause of death in HIV patients. The treatment includes trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole, so in other words, sulfur drugs. This is used as a prevention or for active infection. The medication is used for life or until the CD4 plus count rises above 200. Okay, that was a lot, but it was a very interesting area that I wanted to cover and cover all these different aspects. What I encourage you to do is review the micro assessment, review the disease in review and the future opportunities and review your chapter summary. And we'll see you next week.